Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem power of two. We're given an integer n, we wanna return true if it's a power of two, otherwise we wanna return false. And a power of two is just basically two raised to any power. And so two to the power of zero, by the way, is one that does technically count as a power of two. Two to one is two, then it'll be four, then it'll be eight, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're familiar with how binary numbers work, two is very related to this. And you might wanna consider like negative exponents. What about two to the negative one? Well, that's technically one half, but we are told that we're given integers only. So we don't worry about negative exponents. Now, the most straightforward solution to this problem is to do some kind of loop. Just like I showed a second ago, we can try every possibility, one, two, four, eight, and then go through all of the possibilities until we get to two to the power of 32. And the reason for that is that n is not gonna be any bigger than this, and it's not gonna be any smaller than negative two to the power of 32, where this is the number and then the negative applies to that. We already know we don't need to consider negative numbers, so the first thing we can probably check is, is the input at least greater than zero? It has to be that for it to be a power of two. And then we basically consider all of these. Now, how many times are we gonna have to loop? It's kind of obvious if you know your math, probably 32 times. So it's not a brute force solution at all. And that's because exponents grow very quickly. So this is the easiest way to solve the problem in my opinion. We can also check that n, the current, or whatever current value, let's call it x or whatever, once it becomes greater than n, we can probably stop searching. If it becomes equal to n, we can also stop searching. But while our current number is less than n, we're gonna continue to multiply it by two to get all the possibilities. So this is technically a constant time and space solution. So let's code it up. So like I said, the first thing I'm gonna check is n greater than zero. Well, if it's less than or equal to zero, then we can return false immediately. Otherwise, I'm gonna declare a number, I'm gonna call it x, you can call it whatever you want. And while x is less than or equal to n, we are going to multiply it by two. So x multiplied by two. Now in here, we could check if x is equal to n. Go ahead and return true, stop it immediately. But out here, it could be possible that at some point x becomes greater than n. Out here, we might wanna return false. Now, the easier way to condense this code, and I guess it's not easy, it's just a way to condense the code, is to get rid of this and take this part, cut it, then get rid of this line, replace this with this. This way, the loop will terminate if x becomes greater than n or it becomes equal to n. We don't know exactly which one of those happened, which is why we're gonna return this, this comparison. Is it equal to n or maybe it's not? Also, you realize that we don't really need this either because if n is truly a negative number, this loop will never even execute. X is one. It'll never be less than or equal to a negative number or equal to zero. And so this will return and it'll return false. So we can actually get rid of this too. So this is the entire code, not a lot of it. Let's run it. And it unfortunately looks like I missed one edge case. This is good. So I did my math wrong. If X is actually equal to N, then we probably don't wanna execute the loop. So I missed the edge case where they're actually equal, unfortunate. So we should probably change this to just a less than. So now, once they become equal or X exceeds N, then we will return the comparison. I actually coded it correctly the first time, but always live demos are the worst, but you can see this code does work and it is pretty efficient. But if you read the description, they actually ask us, can you solve it without loops or recursion? And the easiest way to do that would just be with logarithms, because if you know, a logarithm is basically a way to get the exponent of a number. So we would do log base two of n, and we would check if it's a whole number, not a decimal. Now internally, that's pretty much doing a loop anyway. So I'm actually gonna show you a couple more interesting solutions to this problem. So let's break it down for a second and think about the numbers one, two, four, eight, et cetera. If you are familiar with binary, you know one in binary is just gonna be a bunch of zeros and then a one. Two is gonna be a bunch of zeros and a one zero. Four is gonna be one zero zero, eight is gonna be 
one zero zero zero. So to take a number and to multiply it by two just means to take this one and shift it to the left by one. This is the ones place. This is the twos place. This is the fours place. This is the eights place. This tells you how many eights we have. And it just keeps going like that. So one thing you can kind of tell from a power of two is that among all of the bits, we don't really care how many there are or where they are. Among all of them, there's only going to be a single one bit. Okay, but knowing that, how exactly does it help us? Well, it's definitely not easy to come up with, but the idea is that sort of the inverse of all of these bits, like take the one and every bit to the right of it, the inverse of that would look like this, zero, one, 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 one. And if we were able to get the inverse, we know that all the rest of these bits are gonna be zero, there's just gonna be a single one here. If we can somehow get this inverse, we know if we take uh, these two numbers and do the bitwise and of that, meaning for every pair of bits, we take the and of them. So these two anded together would be zero. These two anded together would be zero. And these would be zero and zero as well. Basically, both of the bits need to be one for us to get a one in the result. Otherwise, we get a zero in the result. Now, obviously, you can see if we took this number and its inverse and we bitwise and them, we're going to get zeros in all places. So that's only going to be true when you have two inverse numbers. Now, it just so happens that when you have a number with only a single one bit, it's pretty easy to get the inverse of it. All you have to do is subtract one. When you have the number 1000, like not the binary number, when you have the number 1000, subtract one and you get 999. Nine, nine. Similarly, in binary, subtract one from this, you lose the most significant bit, and then you get ones in the remaining position. So we will easily be able to get this and easily be able to do the bitwise and. If you were to try the exact same thing with a number that has two ones in it, it wouldn't work. Subtract one from this number, you're gonna get these and you're still going to have a one over here. So try doing the bitwise and of these two together. Yeah, you'll have zeros all over here, but you're going to end up with a one over here. So the result is not going to be zero. This only works with numbers that have a single one bit. This is not a solution that's easy to reason about, but once you have figured it out, it's pretty easy to code. One thing with this solution, we will have to still verify that n is greater than zero, strictly greater. So coding this solution is pretty easy. All we do, check n is greater than zero and logic and, and then here we take n and then bitwise and it with the ampersand sign and then do n minus one. And so if this itself is equal to zero, then we know that n only had a single one bit. So let's run this. And as you can see on the left, it works. It's pretty efficient. In terms of big O time complexity, though, it's not really any more efficient than the previous solution. And technically, the previous solution, since the number was up to 2 to the power of 32, the previous solution was constant time. But what if that boundary was not given to us? What if n could be arbitrarily large? Then our previous solution with the loop is technically log base two of n. It's a log n solution if this number can grow infinitely large. But this solution here is theoretically a constant time solution, a true constant time solution, but not practically speaking because numbers are usually stored in 32 bits or 64 bits. Like there is a limit. And if you want numbers bigger than that, there is some kind of wrapper class around that. That's what Python does. I think even this solution theoretically is a log n solution. So one last solution I want to show you, and this solution is definitely more up my alley. This is more of a true math solution. If you notice something about any number two to the power of X, if you were to take the prime factorization of that number, what are all the factors of that number? Well, we for sure know two times two times two creates that number. This can't be split. It is a prime number. Take the prime factorization of this, and this is the only thing you're going to get. You're not going to get a three in there. You're not. It's theoretically impossible for three to be a factor of this number. It's impossible. You might get two times four. You might get two times eight. 
and this will turn into that number. But notice these are not prime numbers. These are not prime factors. These are also reduced to this, 2, 2, 2. And I'm probably missing one more 2 uh, for this 8. But that's the idea. You might not remember this from your high school math or whatever. Prime factors is what can allow us to solve the problem. Now that you know this, how can you use this knowledge to solve this problem? Well, basically what we're saying is that if the number given to us n is truly a power of 2, then we should be able to take another value that's a power of 2 that is technically greater than or equal to n, and if we were to take them and divide them, take this and divide it by n, which is the given value, the result should be an integer. Now, the only question is, how do we get a number that is for sure greater than or equal to n? Well, basically, we get the largest power of 2 that is available to us. And you might think it's 2 to the power of 32 based on what I said earlier, but technically 32-bit integers go up until negative 2 to the power of 32 all the way up until 2 to the power of 31 minus 1. And the reason for that is because you do have to remember 0 is included in that. And I actually think I have this wrong. This should actually be 2 to the power of 31 because I was going to say a 32-bit integer can only store this many possible values where the most significant bit is usually used for the sign for negative or positive. We won't go into that. So basically what I'm saying is the largest possible power of 2 that we have is going to be 2 to the power of 31. Or actually, I'm messing this up. This is the biggest number we can possibly have. So really, the biggest power of 2 is 2 to the power of 30. So this is enough information for us to be able to solve it the math way. We'll first get this number, which is going to be 2 to the power of 30. And then we'll mod it by n and make sure that the remainder is equal to 0 so that we know for sure that this is a whole number. OK, so finishing up, let's check n is greater than 0. and for sure, that number 2 to the power of 30 modded by n is equal to 0. Now, how do you get 2 to the power of 30? This is one way to do it. We could also take 1 and shift it to the left 30 times. And the reason we shift it 30 times is because technically the number 1 itself is equal to 2 to the power of 0. And if we want 2 to the power of 30, we take 1 and shift it to the left 30 times. So that is the math behind that. Now, let's just run it. OK, it looks like this is wrong, but I'm pretty sure we just forgot to put the parentheses around here. Yep, uh, that was right. So we just needed to add those parentheses. Really sorry about that mistake. I've been a little sloppy today, but you can see that this solution also works and it's pretty efficient. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.